the inner journey, which is the subject of this evening's talk, refers to the inner spiritual or the mystical journey into one's own self. I have been talking all these days about the need to go within and to discover the self. On the assumption that everybody is convinced that one has to go within and has started the inner journey, I am going to take you along and relate the accounts which have been given by Eastern mystics and philosophers about the inner journey and the various obstacles that come in the way. First of all, let me make it clear that the word inner journey is misleading because when we go within ourselves, the experience of the journey is still outside of us. One might say that one has a dream in one's own mind, but the fact one has a dream in one's own mind does not make the dream sequences appear inside the mind but outside. One of the mystics adept in a poem has said that it is wrong to confuse inner and outer. They are the same. It is wrong even to try and discriminate between the inner and the outer because there is no outer experience except from what is happening inside. The outer expression is of an inner, inner experience. So when we talk of an inner journey, we are talking of journey to higher levels of consciousness. It does not mean that the journey takes place in a very con confined area inside the head. The focal points of consciousness which are awakened during the course of this journey are of course inside. But the journey appears to me just like the journey outside here. When we start the journey, it is like starting any other journey. One can think of a journey by railroad. One can think of taking a long railroad trip, say from Chicago to New York City. If we want to take an Amtrak railroad journey to Chicago to New York City from Chicago, we can go and get all the time schedule, all the information about the train. And when you get that little booklet, it tells you what kind of dinner service is available, what snacks are available on the way, what station stops will come on the way, what beverages are served inside the train, what you will see outside, where baggage can be handled. All the information is printed and is handed over to you while you are still in Chicago. Now, if you read that information and go on reading it, you will get all the information on what will happen if you go to New York City, but you will remain in Chicago. You can read that book a thousand times over and get more knowledge about the journey. You will still remain in Chicago. I am making this point because many of us who are keen to go on the inner journey keep on reading about the inner journey and thinking we are on the way. We don't even start our journey if we keep on reading. Here we think that this is a spiritual matter. Keep on reading and you are up there. How can you be up there by just reading? The journey hasn't started. Reading of books, even the most holy books, reading of any scripture, any literature, of any mystic, even the perfect master's literature, if you keep on reading, you stay where you are. The journey doesn't start. We sometimes take a book and go on reading, thinking that the repetition of what is written there amongst ourselves is leading us on to the journey. We haven't moved. We have gathered information. Gathering of information is quite different from going on a journey. When I say a thing like this, it looks so simple. That naturally, how can you presume that you have gone on a journey when you are merely reading the time schedule and the guidebook about the places you are to visit? And yet, we are all doing that thing. We are reading the book on spiritual matters we are reading the scriptures, we are reading translations, and we are thinking that we are going ahead. The first obstacle on the inner journey is, and a very major obstacle, that we don't start. We remain where we are and we think we are on the journey. That's the first major obstacle. We get confined to the book which describes the journey, which gives the information about the journey, which tells us all about the train timing. They tell us all about the intermediate station stop. They tell us all that we can eat and drink on the way. But 
by reading it over and over again, we neither start the journey, nor we have any spiritual stop, nor do we eat or drink anything on the way, nor do we know what it means to eat and drink on the way. This is the biggest obstacle. It will surprise you to see how many of us are stuck on this alone. But supposing we understood that reading of books, however holy and sacred they might be, is not the commencement of the journey, but merely gathering information about the journey, and we do make up our minds to start, then who is going to buy us our ticket? Who is going to take us along? We do not even know what is the price of the ticket for boarding a train like this to higher levels of consciousness. Surely somebody has to get you the railroad ticket to take a journey. Those who have gone on this journey and the great masters who have taken people on the journey have revealed to us that for going on a journey like this, a master is absolutely necessary because he alone can get you the ticket. He alone can make you board the train. So when a perfect master initiates us, he has done nothing more but to buy a ticket for us with a reserved space on the train and his accommodation reserved at the destination. All that has been taken care of on the day of initiation. That should simplify matters. Merely finding a perfect master should be the end of the story because he has bought you the ticket, he has reserved the space and he has reserved the space and accommodation at the destination. So all the things have been taken care of. But then he doesn't want that all the people of Chicago should be in New York City. He wants those who want to go to New York City to go on the train. So he says, okay, I want you to come along and I'll come along with you. You don't have to go alone. You need some company. So the master says, I'll come along with you on this journey from Chicago to New York City. The ticket is with me, no problem. So why bother? You just come along with me. Just do one thing. Come to the Union Station yourself. The rest will go together. The second biggest obstacle in our way is we don't want to go to the Union Station alone. And we are stuck there. Everything is ready. We have been initiated. The master is waiting with the path which takes us all the way to the highest level of consciousness. He's got accommodation reserved for us there. Everything is set, but we won't go to the railroad station. In terms of practical spiritual development, where we are outside with our attention in the world is where we are in Chicago and its suburbs. And this place behind the eyes, which is the focal point of the wakeful human being, when he concentrates it there, is the railroad station. Just behind the eyes is the railroad station. All the master asks us is to come from here to there. The rest of the journey, he'll be with us. He won't leave you alone. And we are not sure whether he will be there. We are not sure if he's really got the ticket for us. We don't have faith. He could take us from here also without faith. Because if you see him, you'll come along. But then, since the spiritual journey requires that you build up faith, he says, come up to this point on your own faith, and the rest of the journey will go together. This is the second biggest obstacle on the way that we don't trust, we don't recognize, we don't believe, even the Master who has initiated us. Now, I'm not talking of one who has not been initiated. I'm talking of one who has been initiated. He doesn't go to the railroad station and he waits for the journey to start. And he says, well, one day the train will come out of the station and take us from mm -hmm. here. One day from here only we'll go away. It's all his grace. We'll wait for the master's grace. So when the grace comes and he extends the railway track outside, then we'll go. This is precisely what we are doing. We are not willing to go to the nearby railroad station to commence the journey. This is the only area in which the master can ask, do you have faith? Do you have belief? Because after that he will never be able to ask. And it is in this area that we fail. And this lack of faith and belief in this area leads to our not commencing the journey at all. The only thing required to cross over this hurdle is faith and belief. If we believe that the master in his astral form is waiting for us, right behind the eyes, we would run to him. Mm -hmm. 
I tell you, we would leave all the jobs we are doing and run to him. If we really believe that he is sitting inside, shining and saying, come, I am waiting for you. We will think of nothing else but run to him. We don't, we don't believe. We are willing to do everything else. It's so hard to do two and a half hours of meditation. Out of 24. Two and a half is nothing out of 24 hours. We are still putting 21 and a half hours to other things, including sleeping, doing nothing. And we are thinking two and a half hours we are putting for this. One should put 21 and a half hours if one knows that the master is waiting there to take us up. People say, why can't he go straight up? Of course he'll take you straight up. But at least go to him. And this is the only area where he can develop faith and belief. This is the only area where faith and belief will take you. These words are more easily said than practiced. Faith, belief, love, devotion. Meditation with love and devotion. You love somebody in this world, you will do anything to reach there. You will make any sacrifice to reach there. And yet we talk of love for the master who is waiting inside. And who are we trying to deceive? Who are we cheating? Ourselves. We are cheating nobody else. By not believing, we are cheating ourselves. This is a great obstacle. We have to overcome that obstacle. But once we are there, then the journey commences. When we can withdraw our attention through a faith and belief that if we withdrew our attention behind the eyes, the Master is there. He will be there and will welcome us. The difficulty of meditation arises from our lack of belief that he is waiting there. Lack of love and devotion for him. If we did manage to reach there, every step we will take to reach him, he will take ten steps to come forward and catch us. And we will see that. Every step that we take towards building up of faith, love and devotion for the Master, is reciprocated ten times over. You get all the indications. Even before you have closed your eyes, you will see that every step you take in this world towards believing the Master, towards believing He is waiting for you, is reciprocated by coincidences and other happenings in your own life ten times over. When you reach the Master, He says, Come, I was waiting for you. By that time, you have already become unaware of the body, you have shed the body awareness, you have crossed the sky, you have had an experience of crossing a heavenly sky, you cross the sun and the moon and the star, and you have seen the radiant form of the man, all shining with light, convincing you he is the same man who initiated you. The master within is our own higher self. But since we never looked for him inside, he had to come outside. And since he came outside, he took on a human form and took on a form which we could recognize. Therefore, when we go within, we see the same form. The Master is the same, has always been the same. There is only one Master, that's our higher self. That's the totality made individual inside us. And that Master takes us to totality. But since we have been guided to the Master within, from the image of the Master without, therefore the same form which we saw outside is seen inside. As we go along the journey, we discover that the Master's form is something more than what we saw. For instance, the Master says, now you are in the astral plane. You can see, look around, don't waste too much time here, we have to go further. And he shows us the great splendors of the astral plane. We see the reality of this universe. We see that all these people we saw in the world, they're images of the real people who live there. 
that there are counterparts of these very people there, that they are the real people. We are dreaming about them here. We meet them, they are luminous, they are beautiful, things are lovely out there, such pretty houses, all things are going automatically. So many research centers are operating, people are working, getting their desires fulfilled, all wishes are being fulfilled. The strangest kind of vegetation, trees, they are all there. And we like to stay there. We say, Master, we have come to the end of the journey. This is heaven. Where else do you want to take us? We are content where you brought us. The Master says, but wouldn't you like to meet the Lord of this region? And you say, well, certainly, if there is a Lord, we like to meet the Lord. So the Master introduces you to the Lord of the region, who is the God who has created all that universe and the universe below. He is the creator of this universe which we have been seeing, as well as the one we are now seeing during that journey. The Master says, let's go ahead. But they say, there's nothing to go ahead. Now, going to the railroad station, going to the astral form of the Master within was our problem. Taking us further now is the master's problem. He is having a hard time persuading us to go forward. We think that's the end of the journey. Master says, look, you are still in your astral body. You are still subject to all the laws of sense perception. These senses are still going to hold you down. You are still within the law of karma. You are still within the law of birth and rebirth. Don't you want to get out of it? Eventually, he persuades us to go along and our journey commences again above the astral level. When the master takes us to the Trikuti stage, the second stage, the stage of the universal mind from which everything is being created, where the record of all creation is available. And he takes you and shows you that grand area, much bigger than any universe we can ever imagine, into which billions of universes like ours could fit in, in a corner. When he shows you that you can travel at unlimited velocity and go into any corner of that universe, that you could visit any universe that has ever come into being in history or any universe that will ever come into being in the future, when he takes you to that grand stage of Trikuti, you are amazed. There is no doubt left in your mind that this is such kind, the final stage. There is nothing beyond. And you are so content to be there. Your mind, which has been worrying you so much, merges with the universal mind and acquires all at once the knowledge, information and awareness of all the minds that ever were or ever will be. You have access to the thoughts of all human beings that have ever existed. You yourself become the universal mind. And you cannot possibly imagine there can be anything more than that. You are convinced that the drop of the ocean which had separated has now merged with the ocean. And this is the end of the journey. So the master again has a hard time. Another obstacle to persuade you to go along. But the beauty of that area is so great. In the eternal light, like a sunset, it's a beautiful light. The sky is sort of orange sky. It's so beautiful there, you wouldn't like to go anywhere. The great obstacle is that you like it so much out there. So the master has to help you to go on with the journey. Very often he puts some blinkers, some blinds on the eyes, so that we don't see. The master says, you will have plenty of time to see all this on the way back. Why do you want to see it on the way up? Of course, he knows that on the way back, we won't be interested in seeing that, because of what we have seen up. But it is an obstruction, it's an obstacle in the inner journey. And the master takes us beyond. He says, this is not the end of the story. This is only your mind which has merged 
in the universal mind. You are now the universal mind, but your soul still continues to be hidden within this universal mind. You have not even discovered yourself. How do you think this is the end of the journey? Many people do not realize that the master's real job of persuading us to go in starts within, not outside. Therefore, by telling us the truth and reality of our, about ourselves, he persuades us to go along to the higher region, beyond the Brahm, beyond the creator, into the par Brahm, into the realm beyond the mind, into the realm beyond time and space. It takes us into a region where for the first time we see ourselves as the soul. Till then we have no concept what the soul is. Till then we are identifying ourselves with the mind. For the first time we see ourselves. And the master says, now you are yourself. Now the journey will begin. We say, how can that be master? When we have done everything, left our mind behind, the journey is finished. The master says, but you have become yourself now. The journey must start now. We can't believe it. That we have become our own self. How can the journey begin? But the master says, Look, you have been brought from a world of pairs of opposites. Till now, and even now, all the experiences you are having are experiences in pairs of opposites. This world and all the three worlds and all the worlds below are subsisting through pairs of opposites. Without the opposite, there is no world. Now, the master says, I want to apply the same principle of pairs of opposites to what you have been through. That means, let us go to the opposite of what you have been through. What you have been through was the world of pairs of opposites. The opposite of that is a world without the pair of opposites. So in consonance with this principle, the master takes us to the dark stage, which is completely shuts off all reliance for experience on pairs of opposites. The stage is called dark because it, it is completely the opposite of what we are used to. The experience thereafter is not based upon the pairs of opposites. It's difficult to explain intellectually a concept that the opposite of the pairs of opposites is that there are no pairs of opposites. But take it as a statement. Keep it in the mind for understanding the obstacles in the inner journey. This shift from using awareness in pairs of opposites to using awareness in a world without pairs of opposites is the biggest shift that takes place in the spiritual journey and is the hardest part. It reminds us of the stage when we sat at home and wouldn't go to the railroad station. We can see nothing beyond because we are used to seeing the opposite of what we have seen. So we see nothing beyond and it looks like the great darkness. The fourth stage in which the soul gropes for the other side of the darkness is in terms of the journey very close to the destination. But in terms of the obstacle to progress is the most difficult. Unless the master is a perfect master and has direct link with the destination, he cannot even take us across. Even a master cannot cross the great darkness from the pairs of opposites to the non-pair of opposites. Unless he's a perfect master with a direct link at all times, with the destination beyond the great darkness. Presuming that we are being guided by the perfect master, who has direct access, he takes us to the beginning of the darkness, the top of the third stage, from where he can give us a peep into the de destination. That area, in a corner of Parbrahm, on the top side of Parbrahm, is known only to the perfect masters, who have a continuous link, with Satchkhand, the fifth stage. 
people have crossed the third stage gone to the fourth stage and come back without having a peace at the fifth stage which is available from the top of the third stage this is available only to one who has a continuous link with the fifth stage the master convinces us that he has in his hold in his view the destination so he will take us along when we reach the final destination we find that is the totality that is the one where the universal soul resides of which the individual soul was an illusion and we go and are greatly overjoyed to be with our true soul with our true grand totality it's the greatest joy to be in that area and many souls like ours who have reached there are also dancing with joy and pleasure and happiness there are many souls there who were always there and did not come to the world of pairs of opposites at all and they look very curiously at us who are these folks who have come and are dancing and so happy and the, this soul which has gone with the great master the perfect master into the realm of truth unchangeable truth which does not dissolve even in the grand dissolution having reached there those souls which have never left they meet these souls and they marvel why are you so happy and we tell them aren't you happy they said yes we've always been happy we're living in bliss and joy and happiness but you seem to be dancing with joy what's the matter with you and these souls who have gone with the perfect master they say well we have crossed the great darkness from the illusory world of pairs of opposites we have come to the truth we know what truth means we are overjoyed at this truth and those souls which are already there can't understand it because although they were lucky to remain with truth all the time they never knew how to dance with the joy of discovering truth and the master says see you are lucky to go away from here because by coming here you at least know you have discovered the truth you will be far happier in the truth than those who were always in the truth and for the first time it dawns upon us it wasn't too bad after all to be away from this home and we tell the master this is the great place you have brought us to and the master says sure now you must meet the lord of this region because he is the lord and creator of everything so we tell the master quickly let us go and see the lord so this is the place we have to stay that where he has allocated the space to us given a beautiful island in the grand sky full of light each one of us have our own island of light we can move to other island make social call meet people meet other soul have great joy there and the perfect master leads us to the creator the ultimate source of all creation whose name is the truth sat naam and he takes us to the lord of such khand the true area and that's the greatest surprise that we get at the end of the journey for indeed there is nobody else sitting there on the throne of the lord of such khand of the highest truth except the master himself in the same form if there be a form which we saw in his human form before we started the journey before we even went to the railroad station it's the most amazing experience and we turn around and we say master you were sitting here why didn't you tell us on the way you went on telling us i am taking you to the lord of the highest region at the end of the journey you will meet the lord why didn't you tell us in this world why didn't you tell us in the astral plane in the causal plane that you are the lord even of such khand you are the ultimate creator and the master says would you have believed me here knowing us as we do we wouldn't have believed it is only when he takes us to the highest point in the journey 
and our journey ends that by direct experience of the Lord we discover that he was the master all the time. That if he were not the master we would not be there. That there is no other master who can take us there. Unless the Lord of the region himself comes there is no possibility of going there. Therefore a perfect master is none other except the ultimate creator who comes in disguise to take us even out of our disbelief on to the highest vision of which he is the Lord. Thereafter, we are so happy at the end of the journey, we have allocated our islands of life and we have the grand experience of becoming one with the master. We become the Lord and the Lord and the individuals are together. There is no difference left. It is like the ocean in which all the drops are there, but they are never out of the ocean. The ocean is a drop or the ocean as you look at it, as you experience. The same Lord experiences the self, the same Lord experiences the total. And it's happening at the same time. Having discovered that grand experience of being one with the total Lord, the total Lord says, I am not sitting bored here doing nothing. We still have journeys to perform. You are me and I am you. It doesn't mean there can be no more journey. You have seen me as the truth. You have seen me as the permanent unchangeable truth. You can see me as the truth that creates all truth. You can see me as that which cannot be described. And the whole of that Lord transforms itself into the truth that creates truth and cannot be described. And it's again a journey into another form of the Lord. We sometimes refer to that as the journey from Satlog where Sat, such Khand is there and Sat Naam exists to Agam Lok where Agam Purush exists. Agam Purush is no more. Then the same Lord in a still more beautiful, still higher form, if you can call it a form of truth. We go to Alak, then Agam, then Anami. All these three are three forms of the great Lord. They are not separate Lords. They are the same Lord in, a, in their final form. The form that can be seen, the form that cannot be seen, the form that can, cannot be heard, the form that cannot be named. The forms that are beyond all description, which with the best of intellectual grossness I cannot put into words. There the journey ends and the major obstacles which I have described look like no obstacles. We marvel why we thought they were obstacles at all. In the inner journey, the obstacles are only seen from one side, from this side. The obstacles exist only from this side from this world. When you reach the other end, there are no obstacles. It's a surprise why we didn't run up there at once. We could have. There are no obstacles from the other end. The obstacles are only from this end. Having taken us to the final end of the journey, the Lord says, now you will reside in totality, which does not mean you will reside only in those islands up there, in totality. You will have the consciousness of Anami, of Agam, of Alak, of Sachkhan, of Parbram, of Brahm, of the astral form, of Niranjan, and of this world and this body. You will have the consciousness of all because all one. You have not reached from here to there. You have reached from one to all. The real end of the journey is when from a part we become the whole. When from one end of the journey to the other end we go and then occupy the entire part of the journey. Then we are total. We are at the same time a human being, at the same time Satpurush, at the same time Anamita. There is no difference left. And all experiences are held together. This then is the inner journey and the various obstacles that we see when we start from here. Thank you very much.
Any questions? I have to say something anyway. Yes, good. And I wrote a, you know, like three pages. But you, you already explained it exactly. You know, I had a thought that a inner astronaut, you know, can go up and maybe to the mind and a little bit in it. But then he has to submit or become uh, under the uh, protection of the master all the way, you know. So that was all. You done a great job, my boy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, here. This gentleman is my brother, and I feel like that's him. We all of us do the same way. So if it's true, it's got to be, uh, you know what he said, soul brother? <laughs> That's the way it has to be. Yes. I have one question uh, that is not directly related to what you've been talking about, but it occurred to me today, and I thought I'd ask, and that is that we're directed uh, not to kill animals to eat, but the thought occurs to us as to wearing leather goods or uh, sheepskin jackets and animal products of this kind. How does, how does this fit in? Well, if you kill and wear these things, then of course it's the same thing. I don't know, uh, some of the jackets which uh, we wear in India are made from dead animals. But I believe many jackets, the expensive ones, are made by killing animals. There's a small difference in that. But if you kill an animal and use it, uh, use the skin or any other part of the animal. It's as much as eating it. If I were you, I would avoid it. If we go into a store and buy a pair of leather shoes, are we supporting the killing of animals? I don't know if we kill the animals to make them, because uh, all the shoes made in India are made by animals which are already killed, uh, mm. already dead, not killed. I know some places animals are specially killed to make shoes. If they kill an animal to make meat and then use the, the hides for shoes, where would the karma go? To the meat eaters or both? The I shoes? guess to the meat eaters because they're not really killing for making shoes but for meat. Yes. The first obstacle of getting to the station is, is apparently where we're involved, I think, all very heavily right now. And uh, speaking for myself, um, what exactly is it then, is it uh, it's a combination of a human effort and grace that brings us here, the master uh, out of his mercy brings us to the, to the beginning point, takes us, makes the world a bitter experience, turn us inward, um, makes us fall in love with him, shows, showers grace and makes us give human effort, or what specifically, or all of these things, brings us to the um, third eye. The, <clears throat> the turning the outward mind the inward. The grace of the Master is the only thing that does that. No other power can do it. There is no other way except the grace of the Master. When the grace of the Master is there, we go to the railroad station. But he doesn't send his grace by letting drop a note from the sky or something. Nor does he shower his grace by coming to speak to us and say, Look, I am showering grace on you now. The way he showers grace on us is, from inside we feel we must make more effort. The thought that we should make effort does not come except by his grace. When the thought comes, I must do it, that's his grace. That is the form of his grace. He has prescribed the form of his grace. That when he is showering grace on us, we are trying to put in our effort. In fact, there is absolutely no difference in the two things. People ask this question of me, how much is the role of grace and how much is the role of effort? And I can't understand that question, because what's the difference between the two? If grace were showered in some other form, then of course the question was relevant. But when grace itself is showered by making us have the desire to make effort, there is no difference left in the two things. 
So whenever you feel like making an effort, you are sure the grace is being poured on you. That in the course of my talk today, I have used many descriptive phrases for the higher world. Maybe I have talked of trees and plants and lights and things shining, suns and moons and so on. I have used these words because there are no appropriate words to describe what is there. Let us be quite clear about it, that these things are not there in the same way as they are here, as reflected in these words. But there are no words to describe what is there. Therefore, to make the story intelligible, we have to use some words. So we are using words which somehow give us the feeling those things are more beautiful, they are more luminous, and so we are using those phrases. But the beauty is immense beyond the words that I have used, far beyond that. Now comes the second part of the question, that although all these beautiful things are there, we don't seem to see them, even those who are really making effort and are really having the pangs of separation from the Master, who are really having the experience of love for the Master, they are not seeing those things. I hinted during the course of the talk that the Master, noticing that we are likely to tarry at every place on the way, puts blinkers on our eyes and takes us more or less blindfolded. There is a very interesting story about one great master who had his master living several hundred miles away. And before this very great master became a master, just before he became a master, he got a very strong feeling of love for his master. He couldn't bear to be away from the master. So he wrote a letter to his guru saying, I am missing you. My heart can't stand even a day longer without you. Please permit me to come to you. I want to come immediately. So he waited for a long time for a reply. Maybe these masters and gurus don't give replies too fast. So after a long time, maybe a month and a half, he got a reply. And his master wrote to him, I have received your letter. And I am very happy to know that your soul is moving in the higher region. Your affectionate. So he said, something has gone wrong somewhere. My soul doesn't go to any higher region. I asked for, for permission to go to the master. And this letter has come. This must be a letter meant for somebody else. Put by mistake in the cover address to me. So he wrote another letter. He said, I have received this letter, obviously it is not for me, but I would like to meet you as soon as possible. I can't spend a minute away from you. I don't know how, why my heart is feeling like this. It's never felt like that before. All my thoughts are on you. I can't get out of it. So please let me know when I can come to you. So after a month again a reply comes. My dear son, I am very happy to receive your letter and to know that your soul is going further into the higher regions and traveling in great regions of the Trikuti or some other place was mentioned. So far as coming to see me is concerned, come in the first week of next week. Now he was really quite perplexed. He said, how can that be? Either the master has got too old, he doesn't know what he's writing, or it's really meant for somebody else. Or somebody who's reading out my letter to the master doesn't tell him what I have written. There's some something wrong somewhere. Anyway, in the first week of the following month, this disciple who later became a great master, he goes to his master and he says, Sir, here are the letters you wrote to me. Now you can see me that they are not meant for me. You are writing about my soul going into higher regions. My soul is right here. I just wanted to come see you. That was all I felt like. And the master says, Oh, are you sure you are, that I didn't write this to you? Come with me. We'll sit for meditation together and go into the higher regions. 
So master and disciple both sit down for meditation. And after that session, the master says, now tell me, were those letters correct which I wrote? And the disciple says, yes. Yes, master, you were right. No, no, don't tell me now that you have now gone and seen those pages. I want to know that when I wrote those letters, were you going to hire reason at that time? And the disciple says, yes, master, you are right. I was going at that time. The point I am making is that it is not necessary to carry the power of seeing, which is called nirt, along with the surt, the power of listening, with us as a soul, along with this complex body, transcends to the higher level. Very often the nirt is shut down by the master deliberately to hasten the process of spiritual growth. It has happened with people that they haven't seen anything. A friend of mine used to do a lot of meditation and he put in good effort and he became a very good person. Now today he tells me that how come I have seen nothing and I say you are a real disciple. Having seen nothing you have this faith. How do you explain your faith? Most people build up their faith by seeing something slowly and slowly. As they see more their faith grows. How has your faith been growing? to a level where nothing can change it. The worst calamity befalls you and you are not shaken. What is the basis of your faith? You have seen nothing. He says, that I don't know. What is the basis of my faith? But I have seen nothing. So seeing nothing is not something that should worry us. The great master, whose disciple I have the privilege to be, used to say very beautifully, that the only thing that takes you to higher regions and gives you the experience of higher regions, whether you have seen it or not, is love and devotion for the master. Nothing else, the mechanics of meditation can take you nowhere. Love and devotion is the only thing that takes you up. Meditation is good to measure how far you have gone. When you do meditation and go within and see you are going in with love and devotion. You are using meditation to see how far you have gone. It's like a thermometer. The thermometer never gives you the fever. It measures how much fever you already have. So therefore, the secret on this path, the secret of success on a spiritual journey is that you must experience love and devotion. And once you experience that, whether you see it or not, you are having the experience of the higher world. And you will in due course see why the master closed your eyes for a short while. Yes. In relationship between uh, the karmic load we carry and our ability to get to the, the station. Yes, of course. You have to have very good karma in order to run into a perfect master. Very good karma. To get initiated means you have got the highest karma, the best karma one can imagine. If somebody were to ask me that out of all these events, being born as a human being, going to heaven, spending a few days up in Sachkhand, meeting the Lord of the uh, whole universe, out of all these events, which is the most significant in, in human history, I would say out of all of those, the most important moment in human history is the moment of initiation. Therefore, you have to have very good karma to be initiated. After that, to go to the railroad station, even though it's an obstacle, it's a game of little hide and seek between the master and the disciple. The small game doesn't last too long. He says, okay, if you're not going to come, come on, I'll pull you out. So if you are so adamant not to move out, he can't wait too long. He has to pull you out. It's a very short, short-term game in terms of the billions of years in which we have been in this creation. Yes. You mentioned that um, when we go to the higher regions, that we sometimes are distracted by the beautiful things that we see. Is there any, any possibility of being distracted by 
the sound that we that we made here was yeah the sound the sight the experiences the ideas they all distract us all these things distract us there but then the master is with us to teach us how to avoid the distractions if we happen to go into some of the lower forms which are just outside the railway station <clears throat> sub astral levels it can create problems i knew a very beautiful lady she was my neighbor in the dera who used to make lot of trips up in the sky in the heavens and so on even while she was alive and one day she was howling in a physical body she was a very cheerful lady always a beautiful smile on her face glowing face and one day she was crying and we ran to her house to see what's happened the old lady was shouting they are hurting people they are killing them they are doing this they are putting them on hot stoves on hot plates they are putting them in fire you are asked what's going on and uh, after listening to her for a few minutes we realize she is describing what we think is hell in formal in formal description she was giving so we ran to the master the great master was a guru and she kept on crying she wouldn't listen to anyone so the great master walked down from his house he came over it was not very far he came over and then she could listen to him and she said i am watching hell i have come here by mistake out of curiosity during a little journey up in the astral space i thought people talk so much of hell is there such a hell is there such a thing as real hell what's going on there and i have come here and it's terrible i can't bear it the great master said is anyone hurting you he said no nobody is hurting me but i can't see what they are doing to others i am crying for what they are doing to others and he said well why don't you come out of there she said, i don't know how to come out great master said i have during initiation given you some words to repeat which i told you were like magical words which you can use on situations like these why don't you repeat those words and come out he said i have forgotten the words the situation i am seeing is so bad i have forgotten the words the master said can you hear my voice she said yes okay you follow my voice and in a few moments the master talked to her and she was back to normal now obviously this was not for her benefit that this experience was done it was for our benefit we were made to see what would happen if out of curiosity and a distraction whether heaven or hell whether sound or light we happen to go into a place like that we do not realize that the very hold we have on our spiritual journey can be lost we can even forget the holy words which are supposed to be a sheet anchor against such situations so that was a demonstration for us there are so many distractions i think it's a lucky thing that the masters shut our eyes put blind fold us and then take us through a major part of the journey Yes. Uh, were you there when the great master talked about the mark souls being those that did not want to leave the first place? Yes. Did you tell us about that? Now you have told us <laughs> already. <laughs> the great master said that uh, in the initial point of creation, that's a story which was uh, again put in time space frame to explain to us that when all the souls were sent into this world. some were not sure where they are going and they turned around and told the creator look you are sending us away we don't know where we are going and uh, the creator said well if you are in trouble i'll come and bring you back but that was a small proportion of the souls the rest of them ran we are out for an adventure so those who ran for an adventure are still in the adventure and those who are being picked up as marked sheep by masters are the ones who turned around and said if we are in trouble what will happen Yes. In that line, we always talk about the mark sheet being a very small amount, a small percentage of the people that are here in the creation. But when we go back inside into Sachkan, aren't the numbers there 
uh, significant, significantly larger than the people that are still out into the creation? Yeah. Aren't the yeah. majority of souls back with the Father? Yes. Yeah. The majority are there. The majority is there. Very small minority is there. Very, very small minority. The small number that is out is insignificant. It's his grace that he cares for the insignificant that comes out himself. He has plenty of subjects to look after there. The total number here is so small. And out of that only a small fraction is going there. Yes. Do you think those souls that get back to such Khan finally and tell those souls that never left such Khan about what the wonders and everything they saw down and why they're dancing with joy like you mentioned? Do you think that souls that never left will be curious enough to try to come down and find out for themselves? What's going down over here? No, they are happy in bliss. They never would want to get that urge to come to all them. They have no urge. Yes? Well, why does the great master say that uh, the souls who descended are unquestionably greater than those that didn't descend? And what, <coughs> what's the uh, essence of that? The essence is that the experience of the soul that has returned is deeper and, and better, if you can call, use the word better, than those who have never descended. As I said, only those who have descended and returned are the ones who can dance with joy. The others are indifferent. They don't have that experience of joy. Not that quality of joy. Well, once uh, uh, a said for me that uh, she had some father in law, who's the main neighbor there, why we came down in the first place? And he said, because we couldn't go higher. We came down so we could go higher than such Khan. That is a, a statement not in relation to such Khan, but to lower levels. There are a lot of souls at lower levels. If they want to go higher, there is no other way except to come to the lowest level, the human form. There are souls who have lived in Trikuti since the beginning of time. If they want to go, there is no way except to be a human being. here. And the reason for that is simple. This grace of the Lord comes to us in the form of effort. Effort means the experience of free will. If we have no experience of free will, we can never make effort. And this experience of free will is available only to the human being. It's not available at astral levels or causal levels or anywhere higher. Yes. Our master initiated at least 600, 700,000 initiates or whatever it is now, maybe a million. Now, we're all trying to get up at the same time within this lifetime. Now, do we ever meet each other on the way up? Sure. Why not? If you want to avoid some people, take a separate timing or route. They're all going together. <laughs> Put on blinders. <laughs> same way, we are going together, some a little ahead, some a little behind, we meet each other, we, we meet each other, we greet each other, we, we greet each other with much more love and affection up in the higher region than we do here. So it's good. Um, yes. uh, is there such a thing that we are not supposed to uh, sort of leave the master and talk to all these people around there because there may be some karma or something that would pull us toward that. Some, uh, some some association we have with really attachment, so he put the blanket down so we can forget the Tanumi. The, 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 the master is with us. Yeah. Along the journey, he is with us throughout. Yeah. Therefore, he takes care of it that we are not distracted right. by other companies. Everything is there to distract you. <laughs> That's right. right. Yes. In some of the writings, the great master would say, uh, you keep looking and you'll see the light. In connection with seeing these lights and some of these sights that he says are there and, and that you will see them, uh, you're saying that some people have blinkers, not everybody. Not everybody. What? And not uh, full blinkers. Sometimes they're only on the side. Right. 
You can see. You if you turn see. this way, you can't see. But if you turn straight, you can see. So a person that doesn't see anything can't assume that he might be in the first or second region. When you get into the first or the second region, there's no guessing. You no. know that you're in the first. And you you should that. never assume anything. You should get into the first or second region. Don't guess anything. Don't even try and guess. Where am I? Just go and see. Yes. Does him um, have a purifying effect on the mind just in the course of the day? Just in the course of, of not remembering, <coughs> is there any sort of a purifying effect that it or What is it? Yes, it has a great purifying effect because when you are doing Simran during the day, during the period when you are repeating the words, you are using the same channel which other thoughts would have come. The other thoughts are not the pure thoughts. Therefore, Simran is a purifying thing. But also notice, Simran seems to almost operate on a mental level and almost kind of a throat level sometimes. And sometimes I can, well, there's this idea of bringing it into the consciousness more so than with the vocal cords, with the tongue level almost, the throat level. Is there a difference in its effect? Yes, it's a fact that we do similar with the tongue and we do similar with the throat, we do similar with the heart and we do similar in the mind. Now what we do with the uh, with the tongue and the throat and the heart is not similar. It doesn't take us anywhere. The similar we do with the mind is the only one that pulls us up. Yes. I've never been able to understand what you have to remember when you said to say a similar with your voice but silently. What, what does that mean? Silently means don't use the mouth and throat. Say it with the mind. But he says say it with your voice and he means the voice. Of course. Aren't you speaking with a voice in the mind? Just absolutely quiet. Be quiet and you'll hear your mind speaking. That's the voice you should hear. Well, that mind should do the similar. Which, give, it, which does the thinking. Is it better to be hearing the, the mind saying it or for it to be going on more automatically? It is better to hear the mind doing the Simran. Listen to yourself in effect. Yes. In fact, when Simran purifies you and begins to lift you from the physical body, the experience is not that you are doing Simran. The experience is you are here listening to the Simran. The mind is doing it for you. Yes. Why is Bhajan at more uh, pronounced than Simran? It seems to me that all these people that uh, they find that uh, Cimarron could be the big thing. And I used to think that the listening, and if you can get the mind to be quiet, that that is the fun. Listening is the much more important thing. Listening is the higher thing. Bhajan is the higher thing. The sound current, if you get the sound current, you don't need any Cimarron. It can pull you up by its own power. But the sound current cannot be heard while the attention is in the lower senses. Most of the people when they try cannot hear the sound, but Simran they can do any time. You know, that is why Simran is done to start with. <laughs> yes. I have one thing that uh, you, you said that when the soul descended, some souls would mark because they asked questions why they descended. Now, are you saying that the other souls that rush down? that they are completely lost and they will never return? No, they will return on the grand dissolution. In other words, you're saying it's more than one pair back. Yes, yes. This is a continuous drama. This drama of creation going back, creation going back is happening continuously, one after the other. It's not uh, a one-time show. Therefore, it is one-time story that the souls came and have to go back. When the grand dissolution takes place, all the souls are back. There's nothing left to be out of. Yes? Uh, since we have asked about causal bodies, uh, are we uh, consciously acting in the causal bodies and the causal level? And, uh, and on the astral level, our astral bodies are we're walking around here in our physical body? They're together. They're not separate. I tell you, Right now, when we are conscious of the physical body, the consciousness of the physical body is coming because of the astral body. It's an overcovering. It's with it. It's not separated. The causal body is also with it. 
That is why all these are together. They are knotted together and they are not separated. So when we move around, we are moving the whole complex together. So you said that uh, in the astral vision, you can see the reality that Avatars are projecting the physical. That's right, because here we can't see it, it is covered by the body. How can we be there here at the same time? Or, in other words, we are they, from the astral level, how we can't see it. These words are misleading because when you raise the hand astral and here, that I must have made the mistake of saying astral and here. I don't normally do it because a uh, lot of people say astral and causal and higher and such. They're going pointing upwards as if we are going somewhere else. The fact of the matter is we are right in such khand. The location doesn't change. It's the awareness that changes. Astral world is here. It's nowhere else. When we are unaware of the physical body, that is the astral world. You don't have to go anywhere for that. The experiences that I describe in the astral world are the experiences that occur when we are unaware of the physical body. We don't go anywhere. Yes. What is the purpose of having an aura around a body? What's the effect of it? What does it do? Who has the aura? Who has the aura? Can you see an aura around Can you see? I can't see. Then why worry about it? Alright, so maybe you know what? <laughs> it's their problem who see the aura, it's not yours. You are lucky. <laughs> yes. Yes. Last question. Yes. If you want to, would you like to? If you don't want to come, you won't have to come. Thank you very much.